Facebook. Hey, everybody. It's Cindy. Hello. And I'm so, so, so happy to be here to introduce you to um, one of the most amazing human beings and spiritual teachers that I have ever met. This is, and I'm going to read her bio real quick before I um, hand things over. But this is Shakti Katarina Maggi, like magic. <laughs> Contemporary spiritual teacher. And she shares a message of non-separation between all beings aimed to integrate spiritual awakening into our everyday life. Embodied non-duality, deep compassion, and profound clarities are the essence of her teaching that is offered through online and presence retreats and seminars. Shakti contributed to the anthology on the mystery of being by New Harbinger in 2019. She's also somebody um, that I just met, I think, during the last conference. And you and I had a couple of conversations and exchanges. And I can tell everyone at the sound of my voice, she is somebody that you want to know, want to get to know, want to listen to, and also want to share. So one more thing before I hand things over to Shakti for however you want to introduce yourself, please go ahead and hit the share button at the bottom of the screen and just invite your friends to come and spend these, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes with Shakti. Um, and while you do, the invitation, I don't know where this came from, is to slow things down. So no matter what else you thought you could do at the same time you're hanging out with us, why not um, put that aside just for a few minutes and see what happens when you give us your full attention. I think you're gonna you're gonna be rewarded handsomely for that. Hi Shakti, I'm so happy you're here. Hi Cindy, hello everybody. Welcome everybody in this space together for a while. So I've been invited by uh, you guys of Pew Conference to do this uh, speech and about the end of seeking. And I think one of the most interesting thing about this topic is asking ourselves, who is seeking? Who is exactly in us that is doing the seeking? We might think that we are a person that is seeking. We might think we are a human being that is looking for God, that is looking or for peace or for inner silence or for, you know, even just a little of more harmony in our life. And as we go along this journey, we will discover that what is seeking in us is not at all a person. What is seeking in us, it's not a human being. What is seeking in us is truth itself, is the divine itself. So this journey of uh, awakening to our true nature starts with a little twitch sometimes, little itch, something in us that is wanting to unfold. And sometimes we don't even know what it is exactly, right? We... We might think we're looking for, I don't know, a bigger house or a bigger bank account or a better relationship or something like that. And then we discover that this hunger that we feel is not fulfilled by those material things. And then generally what happens is that our seeking then turns a little more uh, inward and goes deeper. We realize that we're looking for something that um, creates an harmony between us and the world because we discover that it doesn't matter how much money we have, it doesn't matter how good is our relationship, something is still missing. And the sooner we realize this, the better it is. There's nothing wrong with having you know, a nice, decent life or a nice relationship, but unless we are resting in our true being, there's going to be a conflict. There's going to be fear in us, fear of losing the things that we have, fear of not having what we want. And our life is going to be in a constant state of conflict. 
So our seeking turns from materialism a little more inward. And maybe we go in, in psychology. Maybe we think that the problem is our mind. Maybe we think that the problem is our way of thinking or our emotions. And we might stay there for a while. We might stay in this realm of um, psychological harmony that it's absolutely good as well as the having a good a house or a nice relationship. There is nothing wrong with wanting a more balanced uh, mind and working on our trauma or our uh, wounds. But then even there, we're going to find that it's not the end of it. It's not finishing in the mind because it doesn't matter how we rearrange the contents of the mind. It's a bit like if you're moving furniture around the house, the scenario is more or less the same. Maybe instead of having boxes all over the floor and mess everywhere and dishes in the sink, you're going to have a tidy room in your, in your mind and you have all your books on the shelf aligned and everything is shiny and tidy, but still, still something is missing. You want to go out of the room. You want to go beyond the limitation of the body-mind. And what is interesting is that at this point, we might realize that the thing in you that wants to go beyond yourself, or better saying, the thing in you that wants to go beyond what you think you are, this human persona, is not a person. What is looking in you for this inner experience of oneness of Love for everything and everybody as it is, is love itself, is peace itself, is consciousness itself. And that's the moment in which you realize that the entire show, the entire seeking, the entire journey, every little step of, step of the way were actually created by your higher self that was reorganizing everything in your life. For you to find you. So the end of seeking doesn't come because you found something. That's the paradox. The end of seeking comes because you realize who is that was doing the seeking. As long as you think you are going to find something objective, as long as you think you're going to find an experience, either inner or outer, as we say, you're going to look for another one, you know, for a better experience. You know, let's say you have found an experience of bliss or an experience of being at ease with everything and everybody. That's still an experience. It's not enough. You're going to want for more. And experiences, by their own nature, they end. They have a beginning, they have a duration, and they have an end. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's their nature is the nature of manifestation to be always changing. So the end of seeking doesn't come because finally, you know, there are going to be fireworks in the sky and choir of angels and your spiritual heroes saying, yeah, mate, you did it, you're one of us. It's not that. <laughs> the end of seeking is going to come because you're going to realize what in you is actually witnessing this very moment what in you is having this experience, high, low, blissful, dreadful, what in you is alive now, what in you is actually listening to this very voice, this conversation. So that's the twist. That's the shift. That's when the attention turns from manifestation, subtle or gross, back to the true subject of all that is awareness itself. And that's the moment in which we have what we could call awakening, spiritual awakening, that it's not, this is a paradox, it's not an experience, is the realization of what is having any experience. And so it's something that never comes and never goes. It's always constantly here because is 
what is recognizing and listening to any experience that come and go is the permanence of life is the background of life is completely beyond the mind beyond any thought or feelings or emotion completely beyond the body completely beyond any physical manifestation and it's the real you and surprise surprise it's here right now in this moment listening to this conversation just is unrecognized so that's the in a nutshell in i don't know two minutes <laughs> the journey that we have in awakening and the end of seeking and so i leave it to you cindy if you want to say anything this, or anything. well there's a couple of things i want to say and there's a couple of questions and i'm looking to see the first one just to uh, speak it out loud what I took in from what you just said, and there's some tears in my eyes, is that there is an energy, I think you called it love, <laughs> that has scripted everything that has led up to this moment in this experience now. For Cindy, for Shakti, and for everyone who is listening, either right now or on a rerun right now, we're here because love has moved mountains to bring us to the potentiality of this moment. Did I hear you? Yeah. Did I absorb yeah. That? yeah, and it's not love in the usual way that we think of love. When, when we think of love, usually we think the love is an emotion, is a feeling, is something between two people can be friendship can be passion can be many things even just respect yeah but true love is much more true love is the empty space in which everything appears true love is the space where there is no you and me true love is really the the container of it all and the action of this space that is god and is awareness because the, the two words coincide yeah, this is what is moving, maneuvering everything in order to recognize itself. The love in you wants to recognize itself. Or I can say the awareness in you wants to recognize itself. Why do I call it love? Because it is so neutral, so impersonal, so unconditional, so everywhere. So the thing that unites us all that's why I call it love, not because it's a feeling, but because where we it's where we are truly one beyond any differences. There's a cat that's about to come to say hello. He's, hello. He wants to be part of that experience too. Sure. So the next question um, that came up while I was listening to you, it sounds almost like there was a shift in um, perception from being a seeker <laughs> from knowing, oh, there's something not quite right to being in this space of knowing that, you know, who you think you are or something separate from that yeah. is, is a yeah. character or what I, I don't remember the word, but is it possible for you to talk about how that experience arose in you? Sure. Well, something in all of us is aching for an answer. What am I? What is all this about? The shift happens when instead of trying to find an answer to this question, you rest as the witness of it and you recognize that you are before it. You recognize that you are what is witnessing this question. You are the subject of that question. So that question at the, at the end self-reflect itself. And this shift can happen in a different way for each one of us. But what ultimately does the difference is when we are tired to wait for another experience, for another moment, for another instant to have the answer, and we stay with this question, what am I? Then something in you, instead of going out and projecting a new experience in which you're going to be, you know, satisfied finally, stays within. And that fire 
is burning the seeker. And you recognize that you are already beyond it. This can happen, you know, in a lifetime or many lifetimes. Each one of us is different. But I can guarantee you <laughs> that if in you there is seeking, if in anybody here that is listening to this conversation, there is the fire seeking, it's guaranteed that on a certain point, the answer will be revealed. Because this impulse of looking for something will burn itself. And the truth is going to be revealed. Might be in this lifetime, might be in the next one. Our concern is becoming conscious of what is that in us is aware of this moment. And that's what is turning the attention from the objectivity to the subject. That's what is shifting the possibility. And when people come to work with you virtually online, when they come to your retreats or they come to visit you, um, what can they expect? You you help bring people to this to this looking and and it's a little bit different I, the way you work than other teachers, right? I I um, I do offer a path of understanding. So of what is in India called traditionally as Jnana Yoga. But also I offer a path uh, more embodied of more tantric, of perceptual inquiry. So using the senses, using the body, using the form to recognize what is before them. So the work is very embodied, very also experiential. And it goes from areas of meditation, self-inquiry, as stated in Jnana Yoga, bhakti, also there is a lot of uh, um, uh, singing, chanting mantras, and experiential. So perceptual exercise, uh, a tantric approach in which, uh, for instance, through movement, through slow movement, through the inquiry, through the senses, uh, we recognize what is before the sensitive word. So um, is an approach that is very practical, very um, appropriate to bring this transcendental, transcendental nature in our everyday. It's not just theoretical, it's theoretical and experiential. I am formulating a personal question because Please. it's here. Why um, not? Friends and I who studied together a lot of these different techniques, we started a conversation about the body, what it is and how it can be used. And and um, and I just heard this sense of embodiment. And is there a short answer in you right now? You know, those were on A Course in Miracles page. And so the my understanding of the Course in Miracles teaching is that the ego or the conditioned mind created the body to hold a belief in separation in place. And we can consciously choose to repurpose the body for an enlightenment experience. And I, I would love for you to comment on anything you'd like to share in a few minutes about how one should consider what the body is and how to utilize well, so, it in this path. Yeah. For me, the body, it's not um, something for be separated. The body is a tool of perception of consciousness itself, because what is living through this form, it's not a human being, it's consciousness. It's already consciousness. So it's just a consciousness that is not conscious of itself. So the body is a tool of perception, is a way in which the consciousness that we are is experiencing itself in the form and through that self-reflect its transcendental nature. So the body is a tremendous opportunity because it's an opportunity of um, realizing by the creating of this illusion what is reality. And if we don't see the body, and this is a bit of an old-fashioned 
way of looking at the body as uh, something that we have to transcend because it's less important, you know, because it belongs to the relative world. And we see the body as what it is, a miracle of something that doesn't have a form, doesn't have a sound, doesn't have a shape, doesn't have a color, that it's not touchable, yeah, as consciousness, that is appearing as form, as color, as sound, and so on. We realize that this way of going from the emptiness to form can go from form to emptiness. And when it's coming back to be form again, is a conscious embodiment of truth. In other words, after awakening, our body becomes a possibility of conscious embodiment of awareness, is bring, bringing the fragrance of freedom and true love of awareness in the form. So we shouldn't look at our physical embodiment as something less important just something that we have to transcend. We should look at our physical embodiment as really a, a gift of grace, of um, manifesting in 3D or more what we truly are. We are not here to just dismiss the body and say it's still an illusion. We are here to bring peace on earth. So uh, this is the life of a true seeker. Keep on transforming patterns of wrong identification, the ego patterns back into conscious manifestation of love. You see, if you look at the Indian tradition, uh, we are told that we live in the Kali Yuga in the worst time possible, in the time in which uh, error and ignorance are uh, prevalent on the planet. Yeah, It's the time in which um, tradition get broken, lineage get lost, and, uh, you know, violence, wars, and so on run the planet. And it's pretty evident, right, that we are in such a state. But also, traditionally, you say that Kali Yuga is the time that is more fortunate for spiritual seekers, because it's the time in which it's more easy to realize where you are. And apparently all the Jeevans, all the souls are in line because they really want to get embodied in this time, believe it or not. That is in the ancient tradition, much shorter than the other one, the Satya Yuga, that is the time of uh, full realization when alignment is predominant on the planet is very long. And we said Kali Yuga compared to it is very short, still thousands of years, but short in comparison. But what is this uh, this story saying to us is that even the apparent error, even the apparent mistake, even the ignorance, even the limitation is actually an opportunity, it is a trampoline to realize what is limitless. So our limitation, our ignorance, our ego are not there as a curse, are not there as a punishment are an opportunity to realize what in us is uh, unconditional love, total freedom, sublime peace, and harmony. So I, in my work, I use the body, I use the senses, I use hearing, touching, um, gazing as, and you know, to, as doors that go from the emptiness to the form and backwards from the form to emptiness. We can do it right now in a second just to show you what I mean. Yes. So, for instance, in this moment, you know, it's going to be easier if you close your eyes for a second because you concentrate better on the hearing. So something in you is hearing the sound of my voice. And the mind might tell you that the voice is outside and belongs to Shakti with an Italian accent of blah, blah, blah. But your actual perceptual experience is inner. You're hearing this voice inside of you. This voice is an inner experience. So your perception is not the same of what your mind is saying. Your bodily perception is showing you that this voice is an inner experience, is one with you. And this manifestation that looks to be external is actually inner. 
Now, if slowly you open your eyes now and you keep this attention on the voice, you're going to see that this form and color called Shakti is appearing just apparently outside, but is actually the colorful with shape appearance of an inner experience. And we are now separated. So if you stay in this state of perception, it's conscious perception of yourself, you're going to see that what is perceiving in you this voice, as well as any sound of the place where you are, is pure consciousness. It's not something that is a sound, and therefore that's why you can recognize sound. It's not something external or internal, is everywhere. And it's the same in you and in me, because the same silence and in you, he's hearing these sounds, it's the same silence that in me, he's hearing it. That's where we are one. And this is just using sound. This is just to give a little sample. The, the shift is immediate. Yeah, I felt that. And uh, I was sitting here feeling so grateful that I could go back and experience this again. <laughs> because uh, Of course, I've been, I've been a bit quick, but... Oh, know. yeah. Yeah. But well, it can be in any moment. Anything, you know, like you can look at color and forms, you know, on the screen and asking yourself, what is looking at these colors? Is what in you is looking at these colors and shape? Does it have a color? Does it have a shape? And you use color and shape to self-reflect. What in you is nothing. So you see, we are using the form. We are using the illusion not to do mini shit, but as a pointer to what it's not an object in us. My um, perception of the world has been shifted in just the last few minutes. Yeah. And I'm bringing myself back into remembering that I told you we were going to talk for 15, 20 minutes and we're heading on to 27 minutes. And so what I want to rewind and bring okay. Sydney back <laughs> into this body. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. But you don't need are... that. You know, you don't. <laughs> no, no, listen, listen. You don't need to shrink back. Stay, stay in this perception of openness. Okay. And let's carry on and watching the character Cindy doing its thing and the character Shakti doing its thing. And there's no need to be a me again. You know, you don't need the me to function in the world. That's, you know, I'm going to speak about all this stuff in the conference anyway. Yeah. What am I? False myths on life before and after awakening <laughs> is the title of the talk at the End of Seeking Conference and the link to register for the conference. You can register for free. There is a fee if you'd like to get the replays and, and help support um, the continuation of these conferences. They're growing a little bit bigger with each one. Um, um, I, I'm going to ask because I love last, the last line and then we'll let everybody go this is one this is one of about 25 different talks that are going to take place during these um three days it, it's been known to become a party it is a phenomenal place to come to connect for can you imagine three solid days of feeling the way if you're feeling anything the way i'm feeling now you know your life changes forever your experience of life changes right Part of what we're going to explore with you during this conference is this, what it means to live as a Buddha here in 2022, 2023 and beyond. Do you want to <laughs> spend a few minutes talking about that before we go? Yeah. Well, living as a Buddha means living with life exactly as it is. Like now, is this conversation with you, sitting on a, on a couch and watching the camera to look at you directly, is about being here, not as a person, 
but as the space in which all this experience is happening. So recognizing consciousness, the oneness of it, and feeling the gratefulness of it, feeling the endless joy of being alive, not because anything special has happened, but because this is happening and it's a miracle. It's an inner smile that outshine in everything in your life. It's a sense of purpose of every moment. It's a service to any human being and beyond because any being, you know, even a plant or, you know, anything is God embodied, is uh, this consciousness manifesting. So it's a life of service, it's a life of true love is a life of uh, light. And uh, it doesn't mean that there is never pain or illness or things you call negative. It's full of all these experiences and you learn from all of them. So that's what it's about. And it's possible for each and every one of us. Don't need to be special. I'm not special. I'm not a special person. I'm exactly like you. The only difference is that I know what I am. And so you can, if you look back at what is aware in this moment. That's it. Thank you, Shakti. Thank you, everyone, uh, for being with us. And uh, please, again, hit the share button. And don't hesitate to go back and watch this video at least the last 15 minutes or so i know i'm going to um thank you thank you thank you cindy and goodbye to everybody see you at the conference <laughs>